RF man here. Today I want to talk about a new amplifier board that I've been working on. This is a 2 meter board so it works from 144 to 148 megahertz. That's the 2 meter band and it works in all modes. Uh, today I'm going to be demonstrating this in FM mode. That seems to be the most common for people that uh, communicate locally using local repeaters things like that but it works in all modes and I want to talk a little bit about the design topology before I actually power it up and demonstrate how it works uh, so there's there's a side view let me just try to reposition the camera here there's a there's a top view for you um, this might be the best view for me to use to explain how this works so here on the input side this is the input transformer okay it's a nine to one conversion so basically what we're doing here is we're going from a high impedance which is the 50 ohms from our transceiver to a low impedance which is the input impedance of the LDMOS transistor and like all my designs, this uses a BLF 188 XR, so it's the extremely rugged version of the device. It can withstand SWRs of 65 to 1 all around the Smith chart. Um, what that basically means is at every phase angle, 360 degrees. So the input transformer here is designed using just 1 8 inch brass tubing. Um, there, there's three tubes soldered together on each side and then that would be basically the the primary side and the secondary side would be the three windings of Teflon wire here at 16 gauge Teflon wire now at these frequencies there's no need to use any type of ferrite core generally when you get above 50 megahertz or so six meters um, the impedance of these transformers is high enough to achieve the impedance transformation without the use of any ferrite materials. Um, so this is a 9 to 1 impedance transformation here. Okay, to help complete the match I added a small inductor on the input um, just to match the SWRs. Um, it's very very close to uh, 1 to 1. And here, unlike some of my other designs, this is a single transistor, and I've got only one bias adjustment here. I put provisions in for a second bias adjustment, but I found there was really no advantage to that. So this adjusts the bias for both transistors inside this device. They call this a Gemini package because there's actually two independent LDMOS transistors in here. So you can see the front end is very simple. We've got a biasing circuit and we've got our input transformer that accomplishes the impedance transformation at a 9 to 1 ratio going from high impedance 50 ohms to low impedance 3 ohms. Now on the output side um, we've got the normal type of filtering that you would expect to see for a LDMOS circuit um, this is basically uh, pretty standard for all my designs. I use a large electrolytic capacitor and a smaller ceramic disc capacitor. If you have a noisy power supply, you can add additional filtering. Um, and I have that in my instructions on how to do that and, and when to do that. Uh, the power supplies that I'm using are very, very well filtered. So there's no need for any additional filtering here. Um, so we've got some filter capacitors and then you see we have a, an RF choke here, okay? We have 50 volts applied on each side. Um, the RF choke is used basically to, well, do exactly what it says, to choke off the, the RF from feeding back into the power supply. So you have basically your RF energy on this side of the choke and it chokes it out so it doesn't feed back into the power supply and potentially cause problems with the operation of the power supply or even damage to the power supply as I've seen in the past. Um, and again, at these frequencies, right, you look at the relationship of a high frequency 
um, and inductive reactance, right? As we increase frequency, we increase the inductive reactance. So the reactance of these chokes is quite high at 100 and I'll call it 146 megahertz. That's the center frequency for two meters. Um, so there's no need for additional ferrites. Again, once you get below 50 megahertz or so, six meter, then you're going to see a lot of designs that use a type of uh, ferrite material just to increase the, the impedance um, of, of the choke. Okay, and then we have uh, basically a transformer. Now, some of you might be familiar with a conventional transformer if you have experience with some of my other boards or with the bipolar board. This, this is a conventional type transformer. They typically call this a, a CT. Um, all, everything we know about the conventional transformer does not apply to a transmission line transformer. Um, basically, the impedance transformation is still the same, okay? Instead of going from high to low on the input side, now we're going from low, which is 6 ohms, to high, which is 50 ohms, okay? So, in a bipolar transformer or in one of my other uh, high-frequency boards, that impedance transformation is accomplished by the turns ratio of this transformer, and turns ratio squared equals impedance ratio. So there's four turns, four squared is 16, it's a 16 to 1. You have three ohms of output impedance on the BLF 188 here, okay, times 16 is 48 ohms, so almost a perfect match. And then like all inductors, you're going to have some leakage inductance because of the magnetic flux. So we add a capacitor to basically correct or compensate for that leakage inductance and we can get a perfect match. So we typically would put a capacitor across uh, this, this side of the transformer. Okay, so that's just a quick explanation of how a conventional transformer works, but a transmission line transformer works completely different. Okay, this is basically the, the impedance ratio. This uses the current ratio. Okay, um, this is a Guinella TLT transformer. It uses transmission line to do the impedance transformation. Um, it's fairly simple to design and without getting too involved in the mathematics. Okay, we need to know two things. What type of coax to use, the impedance of the coax, and also the length of the coax. Okay, so we have, as we said, the input and the output, right? So, so the output impedance of the transistor is three ohms, okay? And then the load impedance of our transmission line and antenna is 50 ohms, okay? So we take 50 times three and then the square root, and that tells us what the impedance of the coax should be. And there's a lot of different low impedance coax available. Um, I, I use this particular series, TC series, TC12 is, is about 12 ohms, and the, there's TC18, and there's TC25, and so there's a lot of different low impedance coax that are available to design and build these type of TLT transformers. And the length, again, the length needs to be less than an eighth of a wavelength, okay? So... Basically, I think we all are probably familiar with these type of equations, right? To determine uh, the wavelength in meters, it's 300 divided by the frequency, okay? And then, of course, you can multiply that by 10 and convert meters to, to centimeters. So that's, that's basically what I'm doing here. And then you have the velocity factor. And that tells you what the actual electrical length is, not the physical length. We care about the electrical length. So we, so we have to keep the, the transmission line below 18 centimeters, rounded off. So th there's a lot of reference designs available from both NXP and Amplion. Um, and, and they actually specify the, the optimal length of the coax. This one happens to be... Uh, about 12 centimeters, okay, for this particular frequency range. 
Um, so I just follow the reference designs. There's a lot of two meter reference designs out there with a lot of performance data. Um, so I just follow that. But, but those are the general rules for design to determine the impedance of the coax and also the length. And then this, it's not so intuitive, but um, this is a Guanella TLT. It was actually developed back in the 1940s, so it's been around a while. And there's a number of variations, okay, of this design. And all they are is series and parallel variations, a combination of series and parallel together. So when you start looking at the schematics for these, it can be quite confusing, okay? But this, this is a series parallel combination that provides the nine to one ratio for current, okay? So it's, it's, not, it's not basically a voltage conversion, but, but current, okay? So that's, that's an important point. So that takes care of our impedance transformation from the three ohms, which is the output impedance, and that happens to be the drain to drain impedance of the transistor. That's in the data sheet. It's the series equivalent impedance in the data sheet. And we, we just transform that three ohms to, to 50 ohms. And then we have a bottom. Okay, so basically this is, this is balanced, okay? And these are 180 degrees at a phase. And incidentally, that's what achieves the matching, right? Is the, is the differential in the phase. And the reflected power is also 180 degrees out of phase and they cancel each other out. That's basically how these current transformers work. Okay, so this is balanced. And then we go unbalanced with another bottom here made of coax. And then we can go to some end-fed antenna, uh, vertical dipole, horizontal dipole, something like that. All right, so now I'm back. Um, this is my setup here. I'm using a uh, KDK FM transceiver. Okay, I'm on 145.8 megahertz. Uh, that's just one of the local repeater frequencies here. Um, and it's almost the center of the band. So I'll be using that to demonstrate. And I've got an external power supply here for the 12 volt bias, as you can see right there. And we'll be monitoring the current, which is here. And of course, we'll be looking at the uh, power output. Um, I'm using a Bird 43. Um, I got a line section. Here it's uh, 100 to 250 megahertz, thousand watts. Okay, and we're going to be looking basically at the bottom scale here. Okay, and we should see it fully deflect over for for a thousand watts. So let me keep my uh, let me keep my camera on the watt meter for now and then we'll go back and take a look at some of the other measurements all right so we're going to key up you hear my fans running in the background so you can see a thousand watts there let's uh, key up again a thousand watts okay now i have about six watts of drive so this particular radio has a high and low output. So I'm on high, which is 25 watts. So I'm using an attenuator in line with the input of my RF board. And uh, this particular drive is about six watts or so. Okay, and the current, we can take a look at the current meter here. We see about 20, 20 amps or so and I'm at like 54 volts, 55 volts right now. So I run, I run these a little over 50 volts. Remember the 188 is rated for 135 volts. So there's a little bit of margin there. And again, there's the thousand watt output. And I'm, I'm basically transmitting into a uh, 50 watt dummy load. I have, I have one there and I have another one. I don't know if you can see it there, 
Um, that's a MFJ. I get the same. I get the same results with both dummy loads. Um, the MFJ is only for uh, very short durations, about 15 seconds at uh, 1,000 watts. Okay, and, and this particular dummy load, um, I can key up for several minutes without a problem. So that's the demonstration. That's the board. Um, these will be available on my website, RF Man Amplifiers, and I'll have the information posted under the video. Thank you very much, RF Man.